Chapter 5, Part 2. Synesthesia. Synesthesia. Although the brain creates stable representations, sometimes the resulting experience is quite unusual. Consider the case of Bill, who hates driving because the sight of road signs tastes like a mixture of pistachio ice cream and earwax. This sort of experience, such as when a visual image has a taste, is called synesthesia. For another person with synesthesia, MM, any personal name has specific tastes. For example, the name John tastes like cornbread. For others with synesthesia, colors evoke smells, sights evoke sounds, and numbers come in colors. For each person, the associations do not vary. If road signs have a taste, for example, they always taste the same. Reports of people with synesthesia date as far back as ancient Greece. Estimates of the percentage of the population that report these cross-sensory experiences range from 1 in 2,000 to 1 in 200. How can we understand such bizarre sensations? The neurologist V.S. Ramakandran conducted a series of experiments to better understand what is happening when someone reports, for example, that a sound is lime green or that chicken tastes pointy. Because the brain involved in seeing colors is near the brain area involved in understanding the numbers, he theorized that in people with color number synesthesia, these two brain areas are somehow connected. In this situation, one area of the brain might have adopted another area's role. To test this hypothesis, Ramakatron examined brain scans taken at people with synesthesia when they looked at black numbers on a white background. He found evidence of neural activity in the brain area responsible for color vision. Control participants without synesthesia did not experience activity in this brain area when they looked at the same numbers. Although synesthesia is a rare condition, it shows that there is not a perfect correspondence between the physical world and our experience of it. Yes, our brains create stable representations based on information our senses provide. Our senses often provide imperfect information. However, and our brains often interpret information imperfectly. Does ESP exist? Do you believe in a so-called sixth sense or the unexplainable feeling that something is about to happen? Our many sensory systems provide information about the world, but they are sensitive to only a small range of energy available in any environment. For instance, dogs can hear much higher frequencies than we can and many insects can sense energy forms that we cannot detect. Is it possible that other frequencies of, or energy forms exist and scientists simply have not discovered them? If so, might these undiscovered energy forces allow people to read other people's minds or communicate with ghosts? In other words, could people be able to perceive information beyond ordinary sensory information through extrasensory perception, ESP? Many reports of ESP are supported only by anecdotes, not by valid evidence. In addition, many claims about people's ability to predict events can be explained through logic. For instance, if you see a couple fighting all the time, you might predict accurately that they will break up, but that does not make you a psychic. Finally, many instances of apparent ESP appear to be no more than coincidence. Consider the day that Nobel Prize winning physicist Luis Alvarez found himself thinking of a long-lost friend from his college years. A few minutes later, he came across the friend's obituary in a newspaper. Might Alvarez have experienced some sort of premonition? As a scientist, he decided to calculate the probability of this coincidence. He developed reasonable estimates of how often people think about people from their past. He calculated that thinking about a person shortly before learning of that person's death likely happens from around 3,000 times per year in the United States. Put another way, about 10 people in the United States in 2017 are likely to have this experience each day just by chance. The social psychologist Daryl Byrne and his collaborator Charles Honorton claimed to find some evidence of ESP. In their studies, a sender in a soundproof booth focused on a randomly generated image. A receiver in another room tried to sense the sender's imagery. The receiver was then asked to choose among four alternatives, one of which was correct. By chance, the receiver should have been correct 25% of the time. 
Across 11 studies, however, Bim and Horniton found that receivers were right about 33% of the time. Is this evidence of ESP? Many psychologists say that other factors in the experiment might affect, have affected the results. A statistical review of many such studies found little support for ESP. Samuel Moulton and Stephen Costlin conducted an fMRI study to examine brain functioning evidence for the existence of ESP using a sender receiver paradigm where the sender was in one room and the receiver was in the fMRI scanner. They looked for brain differences between responses to the image the sender was thinking about and another image that was not known to the sender. It's in figure 5.11. To enhance the likelihood of effects, they included twins as sender-receiver pairs, since twins are supposed to be especially in tune with one another, and use emotional stimuli, which are supposed to enhance ESP effects. If ESP existed, the receiver's brain should have responded differently to the images the senders thought about than to the images the senders did not see. However, there are absolutely no differences in brain responses. Moulton and Costin argue that since all experience and behavior result from brain activity, the absence of any such activity is strong evidence against the existence of ESP. Yet in 2011, Bim published a paper that presented data from a series of studies that purported to show evidence of ESP. In an example of these studies, participants were asked to predict whether erotic pictures would appear on a computer screen. On each trial, the participant would identify a location before a computer program would independently present the picture. At a rate better than chance, participants were able to predict where the computer would present the images. These findings are highly controversial. Most of the positive results were quite small, and they may have been produced through an inappropriate use of statistical procedures. There have been lively debates since the publication of BIM's study, with BIM arguing that such effects are real, but most psychologists remaining extremely skeptical the only reasonable conclusion is that the evidence for ESP is currently weak or non-existent, and that only careful scientific study will provide conclusive answers. How are we able to see? If we require knowledge through our senses, then vision is by far our most important source of knowledge. Vision allows us to perceive information at a distance. Does a place look safe or dangerous? Does a person look friendly or hostile? Even our metaphors for knowledge and for understanding are often visual. I see. The answer is clear. I'm fuzzy on that point. It is not surprising then that most of the scientific study of sensation and perception is concerned with vision. Indeed, much of the brain is involved in seeing. Some estimates suggest that up to half of the cerebral cortex may participate in visual perception in some way. 5.5 Sensory receptors in the eye transmit visual information to the brain. Sight seems so effortless, so automatic, that most of us take it for granted. Every time a person opens his or her eyes, that person's brain springs into action to make sense of the energy arriving in the eyes. Of course, the brain can do so only based on sensory signals from the eyes. If the eyes are damaged, the sensory system fails to process new information. This section focuses on how energy is transduced in the visual system and then perceived. But what we commonly call seeing is much more than transducing energy. As a psychologist James Inns notes in his book, The Thinking Eye, The Seeing Brain, very little of what we call seeing takes place in the eyes. Rather, what we see results from constructive processes that occur throughout much of the brain to produce our visual experiences. In fact, the eyes can be completely normal, but damage to the visual cortex will impair vision. Some people describe the human eye as working like a crude camera in that it focuses light to form an image. This analogy does not do justice to the intricate processes that take place in the eye, however. Light first passes through the cornea, the eye's thick, transparent outer layer. The cornea focuses the incoming light, which then enters the lens. There, the light is bent farther inward and focused to form an image on the retina, the thin inner surface of the back of the eyeball. If you shine a light in someone's eyes so that you can see the person's retina, you are in fact looking at the only part of the brain that is visible from outside the skull. In fact, 
The retina is the one part of the central nervous system that is located where we can see it. The retina contains the sensory receptors that transduce light into neural signals. More light is focused on the cornea than at the lens, but the lens is adjustable, whereas the cornea is not. The pupil, the dark circle at the center of the eye, is a small opening in the front of the lens. By contracting, closing, or dilating, opening, the pupil determines how much light enters the eye. The iris, a circular muscle, determines the eye's color and controls the pupil's size. The pupil dilates in dim light, but also when we see something we like, such as a beautiful painting or a cute baby. Behind the iris, muscles change the shape of the lens. They flatten it to focus on distant objects and thicken it to focus on closer objects. This process is called accommodation. The lens and cornea work together to collect and focus light rays reflected from an object. As people get older, the lens hardens and it becomes more difficult to focus on close images, a condition known as presbyo presbyopia. After age 40, many people require reading glasses when trying to focus on nearby objects. Rods and cones. The retina has two types of receptor cells, rods and cones. The name of each type comes from its distinctive shapes. Rods respond to extremely low levels of light and are responsible for primar primarily for night vision. They do not support color vision and they are poor at fine detail. This is why on a moonless night, objects appear in shades of gray. In contrast to rods, cones are less sensitive to low levels of light. They are responsible primarily for vision under brighter conditions and for seeing both color and high detail. Within the rods and cones, light-sensitive chemicals initiate the transduction of light waves into electrical neural impulses. Each retina holds approximately 120 million rods and 6 million cones near the retina center. Cones are densely packed in a small region called the fovea. Although cones are spread throughout the remainder of the retina, except in the blind spot as you will see shortly, they become increasingly scarce near the outside edge. Conversely, rods are concentrated at the retina's edges. None are in the fovea. If you look directly at a very dim star on a moonless night, the star will appear to vanish. Its light will fall into the fovea, where there are no rods. If you look just to the side of the star, however, the star will be visible. Its light will fall just outside the fovea, where there are rods. Transmission from the eye to the brain. The visual process begins with the generation of electrical signals by the sensory receptors in the retina. These receptors contain photopigments, protein molecules that become unstable and split apart when exposed to light. Rods and cones do not fire action potentials like other neurons. Instead, decomposition of the photopigments alters the membrane potential of the photoreceptors and triggers action potentials in downstream neurons. Immediately after light is transduced by the rods and cones, other cells in the middle layer of the retina perform a series of sophisticated computations. The output from these cells converge on the retinal ganglion cells. Ganglion cells are the first neurons in the visual pathway with axons. During the process of seeing, they are the first neurons to generate action potentials. The ganglion cells send their signals along their axons from inside the eye to the thalamus. These axons are gathered into a bundle, the optic nerve, which exits the eye at the back of the retina. The point at which the optic nerve exits the retina has no rods or cones, producing a blind spot in each eye. If you stretch out one of your arms, make a fist, and look at your fist, the size of that fist appears to you appears to you is about the size of your blind spot. The brain normally fills in this gap automatically, so you assume the world continues and are not aware that a blind spot exists in the middle of your field of vision. However, you can find your blind spot by using the exercise in figure 5.13. At the optic chasm, half of the axons in the optic nerves cross. The axons that cross are the ones that start from the portion of the retina nearest the nose. This arrangement causes all information from the left side of the visual space, 
i.e. everything visible to the left at the point of gaze, to be projected on the right hemisphere of the brain, and vice versa. In each case, the information reaches the visual areas of the thalamus and then travels to the primary visual cortex. Cortical areas in the occipital lobes at the back of the head. The pathway from the retina to this region carries all the information that we consciously experience as seeing. What and where pathways. One important theory proposes that visual areas beyond the primary visual cortex form two parallel processing streams or pathways. The lower ventral system appears to be specialized with the, for the perception and recognition of objects, such as determining their colors and shapes. The upper dorsal stream seems to be specialized for spatial perception, determining where an object is and relating it to other objects in a scene. These two processes processing streams are therefore known as the what stream and the where stream. Damage to certain regions of the visual cortex provides evidence for distinguishing between these two streams of information. At age 34, oh, sorry, consider the case of D.F. At age 34, she suffered carbon monoxide poisoning that damaged her visual system. Regions involved in the what pathway were particularly damaged. DF was no longer able to recognize the faces of her friends and family members, common objects, or even drawings of squares or of circles. She could recognize people by their voices, however, and objects if they were placed in her hands. Her condition, object agnosia, the inability to recognize objects, was striking in what she could and could not do. For example, if she were asked to draw an apple, she could do so from memory. But when shown a drawing of an apple, she could not identify or reproduce it. Nonetheless, DF could, vi could use visual information about the size, shape, and orientation of the apple to control visually guided movements. She could reach around other objects and grab the apple. In performing this action, DF would put exactly the right distance between her fingers, even though she could not tell what she was going to pick up or how large it was. Because DF's conscious visual perception of objects, her what pathway was impaired, but was she, was, she was not aware of taking in any visual information about objects she saw. Because her where pathway appeared to be intact, these regions of her visual cortex allowed her to use information about the size and location of objects, despite her lack of awareness about those objects. As illustrated in DF's case, Different neurological systems operate independently to help us understand the world around us. 5.6. The color of light is determined by its wavelength. We can distinguish among millions of shades of color. An object appears to be a particular color, however, because the wavelengths of light, of, because of the wavelengths of light it reflects. The color is not a property of the object. It is a weird but true fact. Color does not exist in the physical world. Color is always a product of our visual system. Visible light consists of electromagnetic waves ranging in length from about 400 to 700 nanometers. Abbreviated MM, this length is about one billionth of a meter. In simplest terms, the color of light is determined by the wavelengths of the electromagnetic waves that reach the eye. In the center of the retina, the cone cells transduce light into neural impulses in downstream neurons. Different theories account for this transduction. Trichromatic theory. According to trichromatic theory, color vision results from activity in three different types of cones. These receptors are sensitive to different wavelengths. One type of cone is the most sensitive to short wavelengths. Another type is most sensitive to medium wavelengths. And the third type is most sensitive to long wavelengths. The three types of cones in the retina are therefore called S, M, and L. You can look at figure 5.14. S, M, and L cones because they respond maximally to short, medium, and long wavelengths, respectively. For example, yellow light looks yellow because it stimulates the L and M cones about equally and hardly stimulates the S cones. 
In fact, we can create yellow light by combining red light and green light because each type of light stimulates the corresponding cone population. As far as the brain can tell, there is no difference between yellow light and a combination of red light and green light. There are two main types of color blindness, determined by the relative activity among the three types of cone receptors. The term blindness is somewhat misleading because these people do see color. They just have partial blindness for certain colors. People may be missing the photopigment sensitive to either medium or long wavelengths, resulting in red, green, color blindness. Alternatively, they may be missing the short wave photopigment, resulting in blue, yellow color blindness. These genetic disorders occur in about 8% of males, but less than 1% of females. Opponent process theory. Some aspects of color vision, however, cannot be explained by the responses of three types of cones in the retina. For example, why can some people with red-green color blindness see yellow? In addition, people have trouble visualizing certain color mixtures. It is easier to imagine reddish-yellow or bluish-green, say, than reddish-green or bluish-yellow. In addition, some colors seem to be opposites. An alternative to trichromatic theory is opponent process theory. According to this theory, red and green are opponent colors, as are blue and yellow. When we stare at a red image for some time, we see a green after image. When we look away, when we stare at a green image, we see a red after image. In the former case, the receptors for red become fatigued when you stare at red. The green receptors are not fatigued and therefore the after image appears green. Figure 5.16. Since colors are themselves optical effects, how do we account for what appear to be opponent colors? For this explanation, we must turn to the second stage in visual processing. This stage occurs in the ganglion cells, the cells that make up the optic nerve, which carries information to the brain. Different combinations of cones converge on the ganglion cells in the retina. One type of ganglion cell receives excitatory input from L cones, the one that responds to long wavelengths, which are seen as red, but is inhibited by M cones, medium wavelengths, which are seen as green. Cells of this type create the perception that red and green are opposites. Another type of ganglion cell is excited by input from S cones, short wavelengths, which are seen as blue, but it is inhibited by both L and M cone activity. When light includes long and medium wavelengths, the perception is of yellow. These different types of ganglion cells working in opposing pairs create the perception that blue and yellow are opponents. Hue, saturation, and lightness. Ultimately, how the brain converts physical energy to the experience of color is quite complex and can be understood only by considering the response of the visual system to different wavelengths at the same time. In fact, when we see white light, our eyes are receiving the entire range of wavelengths in the visible spectrum. Color is categorized along three dimensions, hue, saturation, and lightness. Hue consists of the distinctive characteristics that places a particular color in the spectrum. The color's greenness, or orangeness, for example. These characteristics depend primarily on the light's dominant wavelength when it reaches the eye. Saturation is the purity of the color. Saturation varies according to the mixture of wavelengths in a stimulus. How basic colors of the spectrum have only one wavelength, whereas pastels have a mixture of many wavelengths, so they are less pure. Lightness is the color's perceived intensity. This characteristic is determined chiefly by the total amount of light reaching the eye. How light something seems also depends on the background. However, since the same color may be perceived differently depending on whether you're looking at it against a bright or dark background. See figure 5.18. Here's figure 4, 5.17. And 5.18. 5.7. Perceiving objects requires organization of visual information. 
Within the brain, what exactly happens to the information that senses take in about the object's features? How does the information get organized? Optical illusions are among the tools psychologists have for understanding how the brain uses such information. Many perceptual psycho psychologists believe that illusions reveal the mechanisms that help visual systems determine the sizes and distances of objects in the environment. In doing so, illusions illustrate how we form accurate representations of the three-dimensional world. Researchers rely on these tricks to reveal automatic perceptual systems that in most circumstances result in accurate perception. Figure 5.19. Gestalt Principles of Perceptual Organization Gestalt is a German word that means shape or form. Gestalt psychologists theorize that perception is more than the result of accumulating sensory data. They postulated that the brain uses innate principles to organize sensory information into organized wholes. These principles explain why we perceive, say, a car as opposed to metal tires, glass, door, handles, hubcap, fenders, and so on. For us, an object exists as a unit, not as a collection of features. The Gestalt perceptual grouping rules include proximity. The closer two figures are to each other, the more likely we are to group them and see them as part of the same object, figure 5.20. Similarity, we tend to group figures according to how closely they resemble each other, whether in shape, color, or orientation, figure 5.21. In accordance with the principles of similarity and proximity, we tend to cluster elements of the visual scene. Clustering enables us to consider a scene as a whole rather than as individual parts. For example, we often perceive a flock of birds as in a single entity because all the elements, the birds, are similar and in close proximity. Continuity. We tend to group together edges or contours that have the same orientation, known as good continuation, to the Gestalt psychologists. Good contour, boundary line, continuation, appears to play a role in completing an object behind an ocular. ocular which can be anything that hides a portion of an object or an entire object from view. Closure. We tend to complete figures that have gaps, figure 5.23. Illusory contours. We sometimes perceive contours and cues up to depth even when they do not exist, Five, figure 5.24. One of the visual perception system's most basic organizing principles is distinguishing between figure and ground. A classic illustration is the reversible figure illusion. Look back at figure, figure 1.18, where you can see either a full face or two faces looking at each other, but not both at the same time. In identifying the either figure, indeed any figure, the brain assigns the rest of the scene to the background. In this illusion, the correct assignment of figure and ground is ambiguous. The figures periodically reverse, switch back and forth, as a visual system strives to make sense of the stimulation. In ways like this, visual perception is dynamic and ongoing. Richard Nisbet and colleagues have demonstrated cultural differences between Eastern people's perceptions and Western people's perceptions. Easterners focus on a scene holistically, whereas Westerners focus on single elements in the forefront. Thus, Easterners are more likely to be influenced by the background of a figure, and Westerners are more likely to extract the figure from its background. Now look back at figure 1.17. In this illusion, it is hard to see the Dalmatian standing among the many black spots scattered on the white background. This effect occurs because the part of the image corresponding to the dog lacks contours that define the dog's edges and because the dog's spotted coat resembles the background. Many observers find that they first recognize one part of the dog, say the head. From that detail, they're able to discern the dog's shape. Once you perceive the dog, it becomes difficult to not see it the next time you look at the figure. 
Thus, experience can inform shape processing. Face perception. One special class of objects that the visual system is sensitive to is faces. Indeed, any pattern in the world that has face-like qualities will look like a face, figure 5.25. As highly social animals, humans are well able to perceive and interpret facial expressions. Several studies support the idea that human faces reveal special information that is not available in any other way. For example, we can more readily discern information about a person's mood, attentiveness, sex, range, age, and so on by looking at that person's face than by listening to the person talk, watching the person walk, or studying his or her clothing. People are better at recognizing members of their own race or ethnic group, however, than at recognizing members of other races or ethnic groups. There is some truth to the saying that others all look alike, but the saying applies to all groups. This effect may occur because people have more exposure to people of their own race or ethnicity. In the United States, where whites greatly outnumber blacks, whites are much better at recognizing white faces than at recognizing black faces. Some people have particular deficits in the ability to recognize faces, a condition known as prosopagnosia, but not in the ability to recognize other objects. Patient DF, also discussed earlier in this chapter, has prosopagnosia, so she cannot tell one face from another. Still, she is able to judge whether something is a face or not, and whether that face is upside down or not. This implies that facial recognition differs from non-facial object recognition. Facials are so important that certain brain regions appear to be dedicated solely to perceiving them. As part of the what stream discussed earlier, the fusiform gyrus in the right hemisphere is important for perceiving faces. Indeed, this brain area responds most strongly to upright faces as we would perceive them in the normal environment. People have a surprisingly hard time recognizing faces, especially unknown faces that are upside down. We are much worse at this task than we are at recognizing other inverted objects. The inversion interferes with the way people perceive the relationship among facial features. For instance, if the eyebrows are bushier than usual, this facial characteristic is obvious if the face is upright but not detectable when the face is inverted. One interesting example of the perceptual different difficulties associated with inverted faces is evident in the Thatcher illustration, figure 5.26. In a series of studies, researchers found that people are more quickly and accurately recognize angry facial expressions than happy ones. In addition, the researchers found that most people recognize anger more quickly on a man's face than on a woman's, and they found the reverse for happiness. The researchers think these results are due partly to people's beliefs that men express anger more often than women do, and that women express happiness more often than men do, i.e. the beliefs would be contributing to top-down processing, we are more likely to see what we expect to see. They also think that female and male facial features drive the effect. For example, bushy eyebrows low on the face are more likely to be perceived as an expression of anger, and men typically have bushier and lower eyebrows than women. According to evolutionary psychology, there is an adaptive advantage to the detection of angry faces. Given that men in every society commit most violent crimes, it is adaptive to be especially fast and accurate at recognizing angry male faces. Thus, Facial recognition supports an idea emphasized throughout this book. The brain is adaptive. 5.8. Perception is guided by cues in the environment. When we look at an array of objects and a, photo and a photograph of that array, both scenes create the exact same image on the retina. Despite the inherent ambiguity, we do not confuse the real three-dimensional scene with a two-dimensional picture of it. Why not? Consider, too, that when an object moves past us, it may look diff completely different from the back than from the front. 
and its object grows smaller as the object moves away. Yet we still know it is the same object. How do we do that? Such forms of perception result from environmental cues. Depth perception. Pause right there.